organization. Uh, we do have uh, regional hubs throughout the world in China, in Europe, Southeast Asia, South Asia and Latin America. Um, and we're, our work essentially centers around improving working conditions and social performance in, in, in supply chains. We work uh, with uh, governments, we work with international institutions, we work with socially responsible investment f funds, um, a significant proportion of our work is with private sector companies and their suppliers who are basically interested in understanding working conditions in their supply chain and, and addressing those. Um, over the course of the last 15 years or so, we've become, uh, I suppose, a recognized sort of uh, expert practitioner uh, in the area of forced labor and, and human trafficking across a whole host of sectors, starting in with the apparel sector, uh, agriculture, uh, electronics, construction, services, um, hard goods, pretty much every, uh, every, every private, private sector um, industry uh, that's involved in, in you know, offshore manufacturing or uh, service provision, extraction, um, uh, or, or harvesting type activities. And, and our work began um, back in the, the kind of the mid 90s around the kind of the sweatshop era when uh, the founders of the organization recognized a very close correlation between the presence of migrant worker populations and the most egregious working conditions, um, child labor, forced labor, uh, worst forms of child labor, and and so on. And we began to research these uh, these, these connections um, and build up our, our subject matter expertise and and our field capabilities. Um, and so now we're now relied upon by many of uh, you know the world's leading companies who are interested in, in understanding and um, uh, addressing kind of the insidious problem of forced labor um, uh, in, in in supply chains. So to kind of set the stage for the the conversation and for um, uh, the other panelists, I, I want to do two things. Uh, firstly, is kind of present a directional or typical uh, case study um, specific to the construction sector, so that we're all on the same page in terms of the kind of the, the, the practices, the roots, the mechanisms um, of forced labor and supply chains and how they manifest themselves on the ground. And I've chosen a construction example um, and I've chosen the kind of the, the Nepal to Qatar recruitment corridor for that, uh, for that purpose. Um, it, it's one, one slide, I'll kind of work through it over the course of the next few minutes. Um, and then after that, I'll provide a kind of a brief summary or outline of what we at Verite consider to be uh, best practices in, in terms of detection and prevention. So these are the type of initiatives that are being implemented uh, today um, by leading companies in a variety of, of, of different sectors in which we would suggest form the basis for uh, solutions to, uh, to these problems. So, Beginning with our, our kind of case study, then, so you have an employer. In this case, I've chosen uh, I've chosen uh, Qatar because of its its prominence in in media coverage. Um, uh, a lot of people, and I'm sure many people on the on, on the, the webinar today, are are familiar with the coverage, if not familiar with what's actually happening uh, on the ground. And as we know, the, the the Qatari economy is largely dependent on expatriates or migrant migrant workers. Um, and so what, ha what basically happens is you have a Qatari employer who has a labor shortage. Um, there are not sufficient host country nationals to do the work, um, so they need to bring workers in from abroad. And uh, what's true in Qatar is true in most receiving countries, and that is typically you have to seek approval, uh, approval to recruit workers from abroad, and in many cases there's, there's actually a quota that is applied, and Qatar is one of those, uh, one of those countries. So there's a quota that's um, applied, you need to make your case to the, uh, the government, in this case the Ministry of Labor and Home Affairs, Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs, excuse me, in order to get your approval, your, your foreign worker quota. Ultimately, when you identify the workers and bring them uh, into the country, you will have to apply for, um, for a work permit. 
for them also. And typically there are fees payable to various different government departments by the employer. Generally speaking, an employer, unless they have an office abroad, will seek to use the services of a recruitment uh, agent or a labor supply agent, depending on whether you're, it's an outsourced labor contract or it's a placement type service. If it's a, an outsource, you're going to pay a certain contract rate for each shift. If it's a placement fee, typically you would expect to pay the professional services fee of that, uh, of that agent. We'll, we'll return to that point momentarily. Uh, because in this case we're going to be recruiting from Nepal uh, under Nepalese law, um, there needs to be a, a licensed Nepalese manpower agent engaged uh, by the foreign principal, in this case the employer in Qatar. But what frequently happens here is um, those contracts are essentially auctioned off. Um, so the employer or the recruitment agent um, uh, doesn't um, essentially sells that contract very often to the highest bidder, but in many cases to existing contacts they have in the, 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 uh, the countries of origin, the sending countries. Um, this is totally illegal, of course. Um, sometimes it's cash payments. In other cases, it's payment for travel and entertainment, where the employer goes to, in this case, Nepal, to interview and select workers. Um, I believe Ray Giardini will be joining us. Um, Ray can speak in greater detail about the specifics of this in Qatar, but certainly in our work, um, you know, the range of payments at this stage equate to the equivalent of about between three and five hundred U.S. dollars. Um, the next thing that the employer uh, in Qatar has to do then, uh, once they've identified the intermediaries that they'll be using, is they have to approach the Nepalese government's uh, representative in um, in Doha. Sorry, there's a, a typo on that uh, on that slide that I didn't detect. Um, but uh, they would contact the uh, the Nepalese labor attaché who's based at the Nepalese uh, embassy and present a series of documents that need to be attested. The demand letter, or essentially job order, the number of workers. Uh, they'll need to provide a copy of the employment contract. They'll need to provide evidence of their good standing under uh, Qatari law. They will have to execute power of attorney to any labor intermediaries that they're using, and in particular the Nepalese manpower agents. They have to sign a letter of undertaking to the Nepalese Department of Foreign Employment that um, they will treat Nepalese workers fairly. They have to disclose the terms and conditions of employment uh, and commit to paying travel expenses and so on. And again, there are fees that are payable uh, for, that, uh, for that service. At that point, the Nepalese manpower agent is in a position then to, um, to go out and recruit the workers. Um, authorization has been secured from the government and they've got the employer's job order, demand letter or purchase order. Um, very often, a Nepalese manpower agent, particularly in the Kathmandu area, will have workers either uh, awaiting deployment, uh, literally in uh, warehouse type facilities, uh, workers who have paid fees, surrendered their passports and are waiting for uh, uh, to be provided with a job and deployed. Or in other cases, they may need to engage a sub-agent, very often informal uh, sub-agents who operate out in the provinces and in the villages who will um, identify workers who are interested in deploying uh, to the uh, to Qatar in this particular case. Um, those workers will be charged fees, in some cases it's a lump sum cash payment to the Nepalese manpower agent. In other cases they'll pay a certain amount to the Nepalese sub-agent uh, and they'll be told to bring an additional cash amount to the Nepalese manpower agent along with, uh, along with their passport. Um, the payment of certain service fees is permissible under Nepalese law, but invariably the fees that are um, exacted from workers in these circumstances are several times the legal limits um, and, and, and well over what would be considered uh, uh, reasonable. In most cases, workers have to actually borrow, either from family, friends, mortgage the deeds to family farms or properties uh, in order to come up with those funds. In many cases, they're able to borrow at excessive interest rates um, from the, uh, the manpower agents who often have side businesses as, um, as loan agencies. 
uh, at that point, uh, excuse me, at that point, the Nepalese manpower agent then needs to interact with a series of Nepalese government departments, the Department of Foreign Employment, uh, where another series of documents have to be presented, uh, attested, and the Nepalese Department of Foreign Employment ultimately has to um, uh, provide a uh, foreign employment permit, which is essentially an exit visa. Um, and there's a series of fees that are also payable for this. There's mandatory orientation training, as well as medical testing that has to um, that has to occur. In many cases, these administrative requirements are, are arduous and burdensome, um, and uh, bribes are solicited, um, and 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 uh, for the right amount of money much of this administrative paperwork can be made to go away and the foreign employment permits issued. In fact, in the last 12 months, a significant number of government officials in Nepal have been charged and convicted with uh, corruption-related offenses specific to, um, to foreign employment. Uh, and finally, workers have to be also registered in with the Nepalese Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So there's a significant series of steps that have to take place before the workers are actually ready to deploy. At this stage, they have paid anywhere uh, up to, you know, between the equivalent of U.S. $1,500 and $2,000, uh, uh, inclusive of um, charges that have been levied for their, uh, their one-way ticket uh, to Doha. Once they arrive in Doha, then they're typically met by either the employer or the labor supply agent or the recruitment agent. They have their passport taken from them, um, and at this stage, generally, um, they find out about other fees that will apply uh, whilst they're in Qatar. Everything from food, accommodation, um, very often the administrative costs that have been borne by either the, uh, the labor supply agent or the employer are also um, passed to uh, pass down to workers, typically through um, uh, illegal deductions from their wages over time. Um, and in most cases, the, uh, the workers have, have no idea in, in actual fact what is being deducted and, and what it's for. And finally, then, the, uh, the Qatari uh, employer or agent um, has a series of additional formalities to be completed in Qatar in order to regularize the migrants' situation. There's mandatory medical testing, um, there's a visa uh, to be procured, residency permit, and ultimately then back to the Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs uh, where the work permit happens. So essentially, you have a significant series of steps uh, that occur here. In terms of the entire journey, um, those migrants will have paid, um, you know, up to, in some cases, uh, the equivalent of U.S. Uh, $3,000 $3, in terms of upfront fees in the sending country and then additional fees that are deducted um, after they have arrived. Um, this is the, the classic way in which um, uh, migrant workers are essentially um, end up in, uh, in, in forced labor and, and, and its most typical manifestation, which is, is debt bonded labor. You know, if they're earning anywhere between you know, 700 and, and 900 Qatari rials per month, um, uh, they essentially are in a debt bonded situation for anywhere from, from 12 months to, to 15 months or maybe maybe even longer. Um, the amount of fees payable does vary by nationality. Uh, so for example, um, if you had Vietnamese workers, for example, they would pay significantly uh, greater amounts in order to, um, to deploy. Um, the, the system is essentially characterized by, you know, Fraud. Uh, there's there's corruption, both public and commercial. And I think Ray Ray Giordini, if he's on the call, will probably get into greater detail on the, the commercial corruption side of it. He's done a lot of work in in that area. And in many cases, uh, there's collusion collusion on on the part of employers um, and of course the labor intermediaries who know exactly what's going on, but uh, it's not in their interests to um, uh, to disclose it or to assist in in you know, in remediating it. Um, this is not specific or, or unique to Qatar or the construction industry. This is a pattern that we see in every sector, uh, in, in every sending country that has a problem with um, 
uh, forced labor or trafficking for labor exploitation in supply chains. Um, and much of it, uh, and the reason much of it persists is this lack of transparency around the roles and responsibilities of the different players. And ultimately the cost of employment gets transferred to the vulnerable migrant workers who have inadequate information. And by the time they realize what has happened to them, uh, it is basically too late. Um, they're now uh, carrying significant debt. Uh, they basically cannot afford to do anything other uh, continue with that work, even though the conditions might be, um, you know, egregiously bad, um, and uh, they really have no choice. Their, their only option is to attempt to return home, uh, and then you get into all sorts of issues that I think Ray will talk about that subsist in the in, in the Gulf country area where you've got the, um, you know, uh, no objection certificates and you've got the kafala system and so on, and of course their passports have been taken. So that's a kind of a whistle-stop tour of, uh, you know, of, of, of what's happening um, on the ground and uh, in the interest of time and, and giving my fellow presenters, uh, you know, a chance to uh, uh, to speak. I'll move quickly to the, the sort of the best practices that we at Verite uh, see um, and, and our advice to companies, and we do you know, anywhere from, from 20 to 30 of these type of assessments per month, uh, not just in the construction sector, in all sectors globally, um, you know, is to conduct a, a, a risk assessment. Look at your highest risk suppliers, contractors, subcontractors. The systemic risk factors are the presence of migrant workers from particular sending countries in South Asia, Southeast Asia. Uh, the presence of labor intermediaries uh, in the receiving country and in the sending country, um, and the charging of fees to uh, to migrant workers, um, and they they should help. They do help companies prioritize. You don't necessarily have to do every contractor or subcontractor. Pick the highest risk one. Establish a baseline that will tell you what's going on, and that will facilitate the strengthening of contractor or supplier codes of conduct and the implementation of specific migrant worker employment standards. You know, g generic prohibitions uh, against forced labor or human trafficking are ineffective, in part because most suppliers, contractors, subcontractors don't necessarily understand the nuances um, or the specific practices, some of which are perpetrated further back up the, uh, the labor supply chain. You know, so specific standards around recruitment fees and the reimbursement uh, of workers, a direct employment relationship between the employer um, and the worker. Try to cut out as many intermediaries as you possibly can. Um, no, no passport or identity document retention. Labor broker or agent screening and audits. Uh, Pre-departure briefings and employment contract execution to avoid um, um, contract substitution or deception in recruitment. Post-arrival orientation uh, and and some of the other um, some of the other uh, items that you have there in front of you, including accommodation standards and a credible grievance mechanism that's accessible to workers that allows them. Um, to disclose what has happened to them. A vulnerable migrant worker's greatest fear is losing the job that they have. Because if they lose that job, they're still left with the debt and no possible way of paying it off. And very often the interest rates on these debts can be as high as 60% uh, interest per annum. And uh, um, they're subject themselves to retaliation and reprisal, but very often debt is held in the home country, so their families are also subject to retaliation. Um, so that's one of the reasons why having an effective and accessible grievance mechanism is particularly important. Arguably the most important um, uh, measure, at least from our perspective working in the field, is that companies who are interested in, in detecting and preventing these issues have to work closely with and engage their suppliers, their contractors, subcontractors, and labor agents and provide them with implementation guidance uh, and advice around the type of systems that they need to implement in order to um, alert them to red flags uh, and to enable them to address these issues uh, and move towards sustainable compliance over time. Um, 
simply having a paper compliance plan or a paper policy uh, will not be sufficient uh, because, as I said, for the most part, um, the participants in your supply chain won't understand all of these uh, issues or, or um, uh, you know, the systems that are required to, uh, to, to address them. Training, training and, and uh, awareness building is very important and, of course, you know, trust but verify um, once you've implemented your, your systems and procedures. Uh, uh, compliance needs to be periodically uh, verified either through existing social audit protocols or other um, uh, periodic review mechanisms to ensure um, that uh, what you've put in place is is actually having the uh, the desired measurable impact. Um, the materials you'll get will will will. Um, um, provide you with links to uh, various freely available resources on our website um, that you're welcome to visit and, and if you're interested in more information and of course in the question and answer session here I'm more than happy to to answer specific questions so uh, with that I will hand back to um, I need to hand back to Christina, my apologies. You, you have the ball now, Christina. I do. Thank you so much, Declan. That was an extraordinary presentation, and uh, thank you for sharing the scope and the depth of the work that you're doing on such a critical issue right now. And now I have the pleasure of introducing Hutan Homanu Four, uh, who is the Senior Program and Operations Officer uh, for the Special Action Program Combating Forced Labor at the International Labor Organization. Uh, he is based at the ILO headquarters in Geneva, Switzerland, and he provides daily support to field colleagues on technical cooperation projects, combating forced labor and human trafficking, and is the focal point for all private sector engagement as well as donor relations. He's also a member and the 2013 chair of the UN Interagency Coordination Group Against Trafficking in Persons, or ECAP. And prior to joining the ILO, he worked at the Canadian Ministry of Health in Ottawa. We're so thrilled to have Hutan with us today, who's going to give us an overview of some of the policies and legal framework governing the issues that are pertaining to our topic today. Thank you, Hutan, for joining us. The floor is yours. Hello, everyone, and thank you very much for the introduction and the opportunity to uh, speak to everyone today. Uh, we just heard about the very specific uh, case of construction in Qatar. What I will really try to focus on throughout the presentation will be trying to give you the global dimension of forced labor and human trafficking. Let me just put on my presentation. Okay, so basically we'll all start with discussing the global elements of uh, the problem of forced labor and trafficking, and then we'll get into uh, some of the sectors that are most at risk, and also some of the factors that our research has uh, uh, shown to be the main factors contributing to risk and vulnerability. And then I'll briefly go over the newest international standard or instrument that uh, was concluded at the International Labor Conference last June. And I very briefly just introduce you to two relevant ILO tools. So the global dimension, um, basically research has shown that there are 200 uh, 32 million international migrants and 740 million internal migrants, which is which is absolutely huge. Um, most my most people are moving around uh, to to try to find employment or even uh, better employment or you know uh, uh, decent employment as we call it the ILO and better livelihoods. Um, our most recent estimates uh, conclude that uh, nearly 21 million people today are in forced labor and trafficking situations. Of the total figure, 44% uh, or 9.1 million people have my moved basically internally or internationally. Um, another interesting factor uh, is basically the profits, just to show how much money is being made on the backs of, uh, of people that are being used and abused. 
Um, we estimate that uh, about 150 billion U.S. dollars annually is being made. Globally, two-thirds of these profits uh, from forced labor are generated by uh, sexual exploitation, which uh, kind of gives 99 billion uh, U.S. dollars per year. Victims of forced labor exploitation, which also includes domestic work, agriculture, and other economic activities, uh, we estimate that generate an estimated $51 billion per year. If you break this down um, by, by the sectors that I just mentioned, you would get uh, basically that um, $9 billion uh, is, is basically made um, uh, in agriculture, uh, forestry, and fishing, um, and 34 billion is made in construction, manufacturing, mining, and utilities, and uh, the remaining 8 billion uh, is basically what is stolen from um, workers in uh, domestic help or domestic workers. Uh, that's just to you know show you how much money is being made and how much different interests uh, are at play here for different people that would not want this this uh, you know business to end so now moving on to uh, the different sectors that are at risk uh, our report on the economics of forced labor uh, highlighted uh, basically specific sectors that are at risk one of them being construction which is one of the which is the topic of this this webinar and of course agriculture manufacturing mining construction domestic work and entertainment uh, are all sectors that are mostly at risk. Uh, it's interesting to note also that 90% of all forced labor occurs in the private economy. Um, uh, having mentioned the most risky factors, uh, our report also follows up on that, uh, uh, you know, saying that basically highlighting that income shocks and poverty are the main economic factors that push people uh, into forced labor and human trafficking. Uh, it's also of interest to note that other factors that contribute to risk and vulnerability uh, include, of course, lack of education, no surprise, uh, illiteracy, gender, and migration. So over and over we see that as soon as people move away from their homes, they, they automatically become also more vulnerable for various reasons, because they may not know the culture, because they may not speak the language, because they don't know who to go to and ask for help. These are all some of the reasons. And of course, we at the ILO have called for a series of measures uh, aimed at reducing uh, vulnerability to forced labor and human trafficking. Just to name a few is uh, promoting a rights-based approach to migration, uh, to preventing irregular employment and abuse of migrant workers, uh, supporting the organization of workers uh, in, in, sect in, in all sectors and industries vulnerable, especially to forced labor and trafficking. So talking about our new instrument, as you all probably know, we have two uh, conventions uh, that deal with the question of forced labor and trafficking, uh, one of them being ILO Convention 29 that has been in existence since 1930, and it's one of the most highly ratified uh, conventions that we have at the ILO, 177 member states have ratified it. Uh, the other one is 105 that is also highly ratified, and these two are part of the main ILO fundamental, re uh, fundamental principles and rights at works uh, eight conventions. Um, about a year and a half ago, or almost two years ago, um, in June 2012, the, the International Labor Conference that meets annually here at, the, at the, in Geneva at the ILO basically discussed uh, this convention, Convention 29, and asked the office to look into the gaps, to see if there are any gaps in the convention because the convention is fairly old, and to, to see if, to, if it is, if there are gaps, then to, to recommend to the labor conference a solution to addressing these uh, gaps. So the office, uh, in response, organized a tripartite expert meeting uh, on forced labor and trafficking for labor exploitation. And the tripartite uh, meeting concluded that, that, in fact, or confirmed that, in fact, there were gaps and that uh, the office should do research and submit a report uh, to the governing body of the ILO for them to decide what action should be taken. Then in March 2013, the, the, the governing body basically met 
having seen the, uh, the, the report and decided that we should go for a single discussion uh, at the ILC in 2014 uh, for a standard setting. Basically, we, you know, the governing body decided that it should be a standard setting item for 2014 uh, at the ILC. Um, so, in response to that, the ILO sent out um, a questionnaire to all member states to ensure that everyone's concerns, the workers, the employers, and the governments, the member states' concerns, are addressed in this new instrument, uh, whatever shape it may take. Having collected all the answers that have come that came back, then a report was drafted and submitted uh, in March 2014 to. Uh, the, the, all the members uh, and the constituents attending the ILC, and then there was a two weeks general discussions. And what that concluded was a protocol, which is legally binding, and a series of recommendations to complement the protocol, which is basically the most recent uh, legal international standard on forced labor and trafficking. So now you may ask, what did this add? What is new in this? Uh, basically, the protocol um, promotes a clear, a, a coherent, uh, or a coherence, uh, promotes coherence, basically, sorry, in international action uh, to combat forced labor, slavery, and trafficking in persons. We've heard, you know, we've seen that different terminologies are used over and over again, but in this instrument, the link, the clear link is made. Um, as well, uh, it basically promotes um, a better response to the challenges of the contemporary, force, uh, contemporary forms of forced labor, which are found mostly in the private economy and, again, often linked to migration. Uh, it also provides guidance on prevention, protection, compensation, and other remedies which uh, were not very clear and were somewhat missing from the initial two uh, conventions that the ILO has. And of course, automatically it reaffirms ILO's uh, political commitment to uh, fighting force labor. Now let's let's get into uh, to the protocol. Let's get into the uh, protocol and the recommendations. See briefly what are some of the relevant sections for our discussions today and the employers. So there there are relevant sections. Uh, the protocol uh, states that measures that are certain measures are needed to be taken to to prevent forced or compulsory labor and one is protecting persons particularly migrant workers uh, from possible abusive and fraudulent practices during the recruitment and place and uh, placement process and in the last presentation we saw how the recruitment process is often the very very beginning stages of this vicious cycle that starts and puts uh, you know these vulnerable workers into this vicious cycle of vulnerability that continues and needs to be stopped the second thing that the protocol states is uh, you know member states need to support due diligence by both the public and private sectors to prevent and respond to the risk of forced or compulsory labor now moving to the uh, supplementary measures uh, on the, re the recommendation that was concluded uh, basically states that m uh, members should take the most effective preventive measures such as, of course, targeted awareness raising campaign, uh, especially for those who are uh, most at risk of becoming victims. Um, these campaigns should basically inform them of, uh, you know, how they can protect themselves, inform them of their rights, show them what is the reality on the ground and what happens once people move away, once people uh, migrate. Uh, promoting basically safe migration should also be one major pillar of that. The second relevant point is the promotion of coordinated efforts by relevant government agencies. We know that in trafficking and forced labor, different ministries are often involved and not always very well coordinated or always you know, in touch. So it definitely promotes a coordinated effort. But not only among different, you know, government agencies, but also different stakeholders, you know, um, that's also very important. And the third, it's a guidance and support to employers and business to take effective measures to identify, prevent, mitigate, and account for how they address the risk of forced uh, or compulsory labor in their operations. So basically, 
this recommends that member states you know, uh, should provide guidance and help employers, uh, companies, if they're interested, in you know drafting their CSR policies, uh, which is a very, very uh, important thing to, to note, especially for businesses and employers. Now, um, if you could please, uh, I'd like to just show you a very short one minute and 17 seconds video. Um, I believe if I just bring it on my screen, and if you can all just press mute on your side so there's no echo, I'll also press mute and we can just watch this, which shows basically the recruitment process and what was also discussed in the last presentation. That just gives you a visual uh, aspect of it. So um, I'll go back to the presentation now. It's, it's always different to see it in reality, even if it's a cartoon or animation. It, it brings the message home much stronger. Um, the next slide is basically a repetition of what you have already seen in the first presentation. But what I would like to point out again in re with regards to the, rec the new recommendation, uh, there are specific recommendations under the protection section uh, which refer to recruitment fees, for example, and it, it clearly states that no recruitment fee or cost are to be charged directly or indirectly to workers. Uh, that's, that's a very important thing for us at the ILO, which we always promote. Um, uh, also for uh, contracts, it states that you know transparent and written contracts should clearly explain the terms of employment and the conditions of work. And of course, it should be in the language that is understood by the worker because our research has shown that very often there is contract replacement, uh, meaning that in the origin country, you're given a contract which you sign in a language that you may not even understand, and then once you get to the destination, you're given another contract and obligated, made obligated to sign again in a language that you don't understand with completely different terms. Um, and then, of course, uh, adequate and accessible complaint mechanisms should also be established. Uh, there must be uh, adequate penalties imposed as preventive measures. Uh, we need to implement mechanisms for the effective regulation and monitoring of, uh, of services, recruitment services, for example. So those are some of the clear links to the recommendation uh, under the protection uh, section of it, basically. And very briefly, two tools that are available uh, that are very easily accessible for businesses is uh, the ILO Help Desk. You can go on the website and basically there are typical questions and answers that uh, businesses may have on uh, international labor standards. And there you also have the possibility on this website to submit questions. And uh, usually the people that manage this at the ILO are fairly good in responding quickly. Um, the second thing is the ILO's Handbook for Employers and Business uh, on Combating Forced Labor. Uh, this is a, c a collection of uh, short, brief booklets. Uh, one is, again, typical questions and answers, there's some guiding principles, there's a section on assessing compliance, so how to take action, and it's available in many languages as you can see. We also jointly published this with the IOE, the Employers Federation, International Employers Federation. 
wanting to make sure that it actually is useful for employers. It's not just another publication will not be read or will be just put in the recycling bin. Uh, I should also point out that we are going through a revision of this because we published a few years ago and the, the statistics and some of the information is outdated. So we hope to have it uh, published within the next uh, two to three months, the revised edition of it. So that's it for my presentation and thank you very much for your attention. I'll pass, I'll pass the ball back. Thank you so much, Susan. That was a, a wonderful presentation and that video is a, a great tool to show us exactly how this happens um, with the recruitment process. So thank you for sharing that and thank you also for sharing all these resources in your presentation. And now I have the pleasure of introducing our next presenter, uh, Ray Giardini, uh, Dr. Ray Giardini, who is a professor in Migration Ethics and at the Migration Ethics and Human Rights Center for Islamic Legislation and Ethics, and Hamad bin Khalifa University in Doha, Qatar. Um, and he is an Australian sociologist who has been researching and teaching on migration and human rights in the Middle East for the past 15 years. He was one of the office of the Qatar Foundation's 2013 Mandatory Standards for Migrant Worker Welfare and the author of a 2014 report, Migrant Labor Recruitment to Qatar. We'll focus, um, he will focus on what kinds of reform uh, in his presentation today which, that are needed in both origin countries and in Qatar to alleviate the systematic System, systemic violations of human and labor rights, and we're so thrilled to have Dr. Giardini with us. He's an expert on this issue, and he is going to give us a very thorough and insightful presentation as to how uh, this situation happens, particularly within the construction industry. Dr. Giardini, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, is my presentation, can you put that up? Uh, or do I need to do that uh, from here? Dr. Jardini, if you just go to the top. Oh, yes. Uh, do you see it? And you can move it. If you have trouble moving it, let us know. I don't see it. I'm very sorry. It, it has your name on it. If you want, we can move it. Yeah, it's not here. I can't see it. I'm very sorry. That's we'll, it. we'll move it for you. Do you okay. see it now? Uh, yes, there. Okay. okay. Go ahead. And you can move the presentation with your um, arrow keys. So as long as you're clicked in the presentation, you should be able to move it at whatever pace you'd like. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. I'm very sorry for the delay. Um, there were two very excellent presentations by uh, Declan and Hutan. Thank you very much. Um, I hope not to. Um, um, cover all of the same issues, although the same issues are there. Declan's summary was excellent. Uh, so what I want to begin with is just to sort of give an overview of the labor force in Qatar. Um, and uh, you can see that Qatar is a very unique country in the world in the sense that um, you have less than 10% of the population uh, of nationals uh, are nationals. And only 6% of Qatari nationals are uh, in the workforce. Um, so you have a, a, a very um, a population that is dominated entirely by migrant workers or foreigners in the country. Um, the main industry sector, as you can see, is that the construction is by far the largest sector for employment in the country. Um, and if you have a look at public administration, most Qataris are actually employed in the public sector. There's only about 1% of the private sector are uh, Qatari nationals. Um, with regard to the nationalities of the diff are you, is there a problem? Regarding the nationalities, uh, in the, uh, the low income uh, sectors, that is, workers that are receiving 1,000 or less rials um, a month are mainly Nepalese. But the workforce the estimation is that the, the majority are actually from India and the majority of those are from um, in Kerala in India. 
Now, just to give you, uh, I mean, everybody's heard of the Kafala system, uh, and Declan made uh, reference to that. What is it? It's a system of sponsorship where uh, its origins are very honorable, and what I want to argue is that it, it's become um, a, a highly problematic. But it has two distinct meanings in Arabic. Firstly, uh, to guarantee, as in a commercial or a business and business transactions, and secondly, to take care of, um, like a fiduciary in English law, if people are familiar with that. It's a relationship of trust, uh, like the, the trust between a parent and a child, a doctor and a patient, a lawyer and a client, and so on. And in this sense, uh, the idea of the kafala also implies an unequal power relationship, as does the fiduciary. And we'll come to see how that plays out. But today, it's really a system of control and management over the large foreign population who are there to work and conduct business. All foreign employees have to be sponsored by a Qatari citizen or a company who must also be the employer. Moving between employers is very difficult. And all foreign businesses who enter the country to do business require a Qatari partner who must have a controlling 51% of the company. So the Qatari sponsor or employer, or in Arabic called the kafil, uh, controls the entry, the exit, and the employment transfer of all employees. Permission from them must be uh, obtained uh, to enter the country, to exit the country, and to transfer from one employer to another. But the kafala is not just an administrative system. From the work of Muhammad Dito, it's clear that it, it's a, the kafala system cements the relationship between the state and its citizens. Um, the state, when the oil and gas was developed, uh, huge uh, wealth poured into uh, not just Qatar but all the GCC states. But the state really had, did not have the capacity to deal with the huge far numbers of foreign workers that they needed to develop the countries. And so the responsibility and authority for migrant workers was delegated to private citizens, just as I have described. And therefore, both the state and the citizens themselves control the right of entry and the right of exit. It's also a means for the state distribution of wealth to its citizens in both public and the private sectors. And it also serves to exclude migrants from franchise um, in or citizenship uh, and to maintain the socio and political power structures within the country. It minimizes competition between its citizens, and it prevents a local labor market. We are, it's important to note that there are no or very little uh, in the way of um, labor markets in the GCC states. Uh, workers are um, obtained on an international labor market, and I can talk more about that a bit later. Uh, well, so in this sense, the international labor market is a market for uh, workers going from poor countries uh, where they don't have access to employment um, and it's um, often desperate situations, as Declan has described, where they are desperate for work and will take um, uh, incredible measures to find work in, in other countries and particularly um, in the GCC states. It also means that uh, I should, as a a note here that the wage differentials within occupations are largely the result of this international labor market. That is, um, if you are negotiating to get workers from uh, Nepal or the Philippines, Sri Lanka or India, um, these negotiations might mean that people who are doing the same job but are getting different salary levels based upon their nationality. Um, and that's something that is an important consideration because it breaches the principle of equal pay for equal work. Now, the countries of origin are also um, very, very keen for their nationals to find work in other countries. It reduces unemployment in their countries, and it, but it also provides tremendous income in foreign currency earnings when those workers uh, send their wages 
back to their families to support them. And you can see there the kinds of figures of remittances uh, that, are, that go back to um, these countries that are very significant in, their, uh, in terms of G the proportion of GDP that these foreign currency earnings uh, provide for them. So in a way, one can actually argue that these countries, developing countries, are also in the business of exporting labor. Um, and those remittances are very, very important to them. And that can also have uh, an implication with regard to the way in which um, the, the governments of these countries only have limited scope to protect their, their nationals when they are um, uh, in trouble, uh, and get, um, victims of forced labor and trafficking and so on and so forth because they also want to maintain the um, access to those countries for their nationals to work and earn a living. Um, this is reflected, this is the um, Bureau of Manpower, Employment and Training in Dhaka in Bangladesh. And what you can see there with regard to the remittances is that the Western Union organization is ever present in these um, origin countries to facilitate and to also take commissions for all the monies that are being sent back uh, in the remittances. And that's part of their poster uh, showing the international flows of uh, money. Now, as Declan um, uh, and Hutan have pointed out, the issue of workers paying fees uh, to the recruitment agencies in the origin countries is a critical issue. And as Declan's pointed out too, they often um, take people take out loans, which is a lot of money for them. They're very poor, and with high interest uh, rates, 30 to 60 percent. Um, and they're paying anything between 400 and 3,000, and we've heard of a lot uh, larger figures also being paid by these workers to the recruitment agency in order to procure the job. A former ILO. Um, uh, a person said that these are not fee these are not charges for the services of the recruitment agencies, but rather they are bribes. I prefer to call these call this extortion rather than bribes because it's not that the workers are going and bribing the recruitment agents to get the job, but rather the recruitment agents tell them that if you want a job, this is what it's going to cost you. And as has been pointed out, this breaches um, not only uh, the ILO Convention uh, 181, uh, where private employment agencies should not charge anything to workers, but in fact, in the Qatari labor law, it says that um, workers are not to pay recruitment fees. Nonetheless, this, uh, this still goes on, and largely in the origin countries, although there is also evidence of it happening within Qatar as well. Now, what this does, when, when workers are paying these fees, it distorts the labor market. People are being selected on the basis of their ability and willingness to pay these recruitment uh, fees, charges, whatever you want to call them. Um, and uh, what it does, as has also been pointed out, is that you get deception in the wage levels, substitute contracts, and there's also a lot of playing around with food allowances, which I can elaborate later on, but I don't quite have time right now. Now, what this does is it places these vulnerable workers into debt bondage, forced labor, and trafficking. And let me just give you a, a little anecdote. Um, one of the, the common exchanges when I interview workers here is I ask them, "Did you um, uh, are you getting the salary that you were promised before you left your country?" No. Uh, well, you know, when you arrived, did you tell that to the company? And they said, "Yes." And I said, "Well, what did the company say?" Well, the company said, if you don't like it, you can go home. Now, the problem with this is that the, 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 um, the company knows that the worker is in debt and has to repay that debt and knows that they have, don't even have the airfare to return home. So they are really trapped. They're trapped because of the debt that they owe 
They're trapped because they are, um, in this country and other GC state, C states, they are trapped because they are under the kafala system where they need permission from their employer to even be able to leave the country. And in, indeed, they have to work with whatever they are offered because they have to pay back that debt. Now, how does this work? It's, it's, it's far more complicated than that in many ways. Um, the, there are so many private recruitment agencies in the origin countries vying for the business, vying for the contracts by the employing companies in the destination country uh, to get that uh, labor supply contract. And the tradition that's now been going on for decades is that they do not charge the company, uh, the employing company, anything for the recruitment fees. Uh, some companies do pay the recruitment fees, but sometimes the recruitment agency will not only take those fees and charges from the, from the employing company, they'll also take it from the workers. And the problem is that um, nobody asks these questions and it just, they just allow it to occur. Now, not only that, but where companies are not paying the recruitment fees, it means that they can keep their costs down uh, when they're bidding for a project uh, in the uh, destination country. Uh, and where you have a policy of contracts for projects being um, granted or awarded on the basis of the lowest price that's being bid, then you have a, a potential problem in that the, 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 if the company is not paying the recruitment charges to keep its costs low in order to win the bid, then it's going to place pressure not to pay recruitment fees and uh, to get the lowest wages possible. And that the pressure that they have will be forced also down the supply chain to their subcontractors and the subcontractors' subcontractors, right? Now, what agencies, the recruitment agencies also do is that they will sometimes pay the employing company um, cash in order to uh, get the labor supply contract. Now, this is well known and it's widespread. So that um, it even happened to me when I was doing my research, I was offered a bribe to provide a labor supply contract from a recruitment agency in one of the origin countries. And um, it's actually the, the figures that Hutan provided about the um, uh, the kind of costs in all of this and forced labor is quite right. And, and that's what happens. So I was offered $600 per person. Um, in other words, if I provided a labor supply contract for 100 workers, that agency will give me $60,000 in my pocket um, uh, with no paperwork. Um, and where does the agency get that money? It gets the money by charging the workers. So the workers are unaware of how the money that they're paying um, is being distributed. It is, it is the source of so much corruption in this industry. Um, and that's the, the, the kind of corruption that we really are trying to uh, overcome. And the main way to overcome that is for workers to stop paying these recruitment fees to the recruitment agencies um, and to comply with not only the law but the ILO convention as well. So this is the corruption and kickbacks that, 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 that goes on uh, on a daily basis. Now, uh, as you had pointed out, I was part of the uh, team that wrote the mandatory standards for migrant worker welfare for the Qatar Foundation, which is now being taken up by the Supreme Committee for the 2022 uh, World Cup. Yeah. Um, now, uh, these, these standards were brought in to design to be uh, implemented at a commercial level. That is that all new contracts for the Qatar Foundation and for other very large um, uh, companies uh, doing construction work here in Qatar, um, give these standards to any contractor in 
that is tendering for a project and they have to uh, show that they can comply with these standards. And part of these standards um, uh, includes the recruitment process and it's made very, very clear that workers are not to pay the recruitment agency and that they are to arrive in Qatar debt free. The standards also um, cover in great detail issues to do with health and safety, food, uh, supply, uh, transport, uh, accommodation, and so on and so forth. Um, there, have also, there has also been, uh, you know, from a lot of pressure um, from many um, different sources, uh, promised legislative reform. Uh, these were promised to be implemented in early 2015, but they seem to have been um, uh, delayed for various reasons. And one of the promises is that the kafala system will be reformed and that will no longer be privatized and that all the, the sponsorship system will be uh, handled by the state and that the, um, um, it will be a more a relationship between employees and employers on the basis of contracts. Now, we don't have any more details than that, um, uh, but that's what has been stated. Uh, with regard to wages, they have made it clear that all workers from here on are now to be paid by bank transfer, which will ensure there will be an official record of exactly how much is paid and when it is paid, because one of the main complaints of workers indeed is the late or non-payment of their wages. And it's absolutely crucial for them not only to repay the debts that they have back home, but also to support their families. What is clear by, from the research that's been done here is that over, well over 70% of the workers here in the construction sector are married with dependent children and their income is crucial for their livelihood back home. The government has also um, said that the exit visas um, will no longer require the permission of the employer, but people leaving the country have to apply to, uh, to exit 72 hours before departure and that will give um, some time in case there is a dispute um, for the employer or partner or whoever it might be, the sponsor, um, uh, before uh, 72 hours they'll give them the time to make a complaint or bring some kind of um, uh, travel uh, ban for that person. The NOCs, which means uh, non-objection certificate in order to change employers, they, they said that that will be reformed, that, that no permission will be required by the employer, but at the end of the contract. And if the contract is an indeterminate period, it'll be five years. Okay. Now these have not yet been implemented, but these are the promised reforms by the government. Um, what I have argued in my report to the Qatar Foundation on the recruitment uh, process and practices is that there needs to be bilateral or multilateral agreements between the governments of the destination country and the origin countries that they institute ethical recruitment. Uh, and this is important that hasn't been mentioned before. That part of the process of reforming the recruitment process and stopping uh, workers from paying the recruitment agencies is to make sure that these are ethical recruitment agencies and that there, there are now, uh, there is now um, an accreditation program uh, to accredit uh, ethical recruitment agencies. Um, because of the difficulty in trust with regard to recruitment agencies, that is trusting that they will not charge workers anything, they um, need to be clearly ethical recruitment agencies, part of the definition of an ethical recruitment agency or agent is somebody or an organization that does not charge workers, but rather just takes the money from the employing uh, company in the destination country. And we have seen uh, very recently, just in the last few days, a statement by the Qatari Minister of Labor who has been in Nepal uh, negotiating with the Nepali government that, uh, to supply uh, more uh, workers from Nepal that um, companies who, um, that 
allow workers to be paying recruitment fees will be punished. And um, so this is, this is a, a relatively new development uh, uh, for the Minister of Labor to come out and state this quite openly. There also needs to be greater transparency in the project tendering process because uh, we need to see when a company tenders for a project, we need to see what their labor costs are, are actually going to be and to make sure that the recruitment um, charges are going to be paid by them and not by the workers. Because the workers paying these fees is what traps them into the debt bondage and the forced labor. And lastly, that there should be increased labor ministry inspections. The, the Labor Ministry, Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs here has increased the numbers of inspectors um, to audit companies and to interview workers uh, to see the level of compliance to the standards and to the, the labor law. And I think that also we need to see far more prosecutions uh, for those violators um, in, in the country. Um, so that's it. I think I've, I did my time right now, but um, these are the sorts of reforms that are uh, both being implemented and in process of being um, implemented, and I'm happy to ask any further questions about that. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Giordani. That is a, a very thorough and um, incredible presentation about the work that you're doing and the reform process. Um, so grateful to you for being on our webinar today. And as a reminder to all of our participants, if you have any questions for our discussion, um, we're entering into our discussion period right now. We're going to be having about 35 minutes of discussion, so please send in your questions to the chat box um, on the lower right-hand part of your screen, and we'll get those questions answered. Uh, we also, as a reminder, are recording uh, this present these presentations and this webinar today, and we will be sending this out um, to anyone who's interested and, and those who could not be here, um, including all of the PowerPoint presentations that you see. So if you miss something or you want to get a statistic or a resource, you will be able to access that. So please let me know if you'd like to um, get that recording, and you can email me at cbain at babson.edu, and I will also type that in the chat box as well. So now to begin our discussion, um, so thank you to all of our presenters for uh, presenting your various perspectives on such a critical issue. And, and since this is a conversation about what is happening in the private sector and, and specifically what is happening in the construction industry in terms of combating human trafficking, uh, each of you have mentioned uh, a number of things that can be done uh, in terms of addressing this issue, but what would you say is the single most important thing that a construction company could do immediately to address this issue? I know some of you are working directly with companies in terms of training um, and enforcement, um, but what would you say would be the most immediate promising practice that they could implement based on uh, what you've seen? And this is for any of our panelists, so please jump in. Well, I mean, I, go ahead, Ray. <laughs> go ahead, Cal, uh, Declan, you were ahead of me. Hey, it's Hutan, actually. I just wanted to give the, the very quick, easy answer that, the, the you know, what can be done very quickly and um, immediately is proper training for all the relevant people within the company and a CSR policy that adheres to, uh, you know, human rights, respecting human rights, basically. That's the easiest and quickest thing that can be done, you know. Have a CSR policy, make sure that the relevant people are trained and are aware of the different, uh, the, you know, problems that exist and, uh, uh, you know, the procurement people, the HR people, um, those people. That would be my quick and easy, uh, dirty solution. <laughs> Yes. Uh, uh, can I come in now? Um, yeah, I agree with you entirely. Um, and, and I think that those procurement and HR people are critical in all of this and that they need to look into their recruitment practices and to stop 
the practice of workers paying. They need to interview workers and they need to um, look into their whole supply chain, depending on where they are in that, uh, and make sure it's not just in the contracting company, but in their sub with their subcontractors and all the way down the chain. And that's the kind of thing that Verite uh, does uh, extremely well. Um, and uh, they need also to take care with regard to who they are contracting uh, to supply the labor um, uh, that, that, that they need. And this is where the ethical recruitment agencies, I think, are critical. There are not many, but they are to be developed. And that's, that's I think, a, a major issue uh, to convert existing unscrupulous, possibly, uh, agencies into ethical agencies who are content to just receive the charges and, and make uh, negotiate with the employing company um, to uh, maintain their business and to leave the workers free of that debt uh, and payment. I think this is this is critical uh, and needs to be done across the board. Uh, there are many many excuses that people make to say that it's too difficult and there's the pressure of time and to change this, and there are not enough um, uh, suppliers who are ethical uh, labor suppliers and so on. But you have to start somewhere, and this is crucial. And I have been talking to companies, and I know that some companies are indeed doing this right now, um, and being very, very careful in who they are going to contract with in the origin countries. And this should be done alongside with uh, government support for these ethical uh, recruitment uh, principles and practices. Um, uh, and um, there are also, you can use in some countries, there are government recruitment agencies also who uh, do not charge or charge extremely uh, little um, in order to ensure that workers are not um, burdened by this debt that really is the source of the forced labor in the in the industries that we are talking about. Uh, this is this is Declan here from Verite. Yeah, I would certainly echo uh, what both Hutan and, and, and Ray have said. Um, from you know from our work in in the field where we either uncover instances of forced labor as defined by international law and standards or where we identify elevated risks um, in, in company supply chain, the, the common denominator root cause um, is lack of visibility into the labor supply chain. Um, that is inadequate screening, uh, oversight, and, and ongoing management in particular of labor intermediaries in both the receiving country, as well as in the in the sending country. Now, the the particular practices uh, in terms of charging of recruitment fees, passport retention, contract substitution, are are all the kind of the the indicators, if you like. Um, the root cause, generally speaking, however, almost exclusively, is companies have either outsourced that responsibility entirely, or they have chosen not to pay attention to it. They've chosen to either look the other way um, or um, uh, they implicitly trust their partners. What many of them fail to realize, however, is those agents um, are very often their authorized legal representatives in both the receiving country and in the sending country. So for in Nepal, for example, when a foreign worker permit is issued, to an aspiring uh, uh, migrant worker who's about to deploy, it's issued in the name of the foreign principal, the employer in in the country, and, and their name and address is stamped in the passport of that worker. So there is a pre-existing um, agency relationship there, um, and where employers don't take that seriously and don't uh, insist on, on uh, you know, transparency and, and understanding what's been done on their part, 
that's where these these practices flourish. Um, you know, Ray listed off the, the the other, and we covered in the presentation the other you know the other initiatives, ensuring recruitment fees aren't paid, uh, ensuring they're reimbursed if they are, uh, etc. Um, but a very sort of important point uh, that companies can look at very easily. Just look at your commercial contracts uh, with your um, with your labor agents or look at your contractors agreements with their labor agents. Who pays the fees? If you see that um, legitimate professional service fees are not being paid, then you can you're almost guaranteed that workers are paying those fees because the, the agents, you've seen the chart, you've seen the, the infographic rather, it's, it's an arduous, it's a complex uh, and costly process. Um, the legitimate costs of migration are probably, uh, depending on the, the combination of sending and receiving countries, you know, directionally are probably the equivalent of US $2,000. If the entity that is availing of the labor is not paying that, then somebody else is. It's unlikely to be the agents on their own bat. Um, in all probability, that cost is being transferred illegally to the uh, to the workers. Thank yes. You, and, oh, go ahead, Ray. Sorry, let me just add to that. Uh, what, one of the things I've also found is that where a worker may not be, even be able to get a loan to pay the recruitment agency. Sometimes the recruitment agency themselves will be the ones who are providing the loan to the worker, um, and it's going to come out of their salary. Uh, now, while the law in Qatar says that workers should not be paying recruitment fees, uh, the practice does still occur. Uh, but there's no transparency. It, nobody, it, the, the problem of policing it, the problem of being able to see what's going on is very, very difficult. We are talking about many thousands of companies and they can't all easily be audited in, in quick time. So they understand that and that's why um, they're able to get away with it. Um, one of the things that struck me when I interviewed recruitment agencies in the origin countries, and I went to five, the five of the main origin countries, was that the agents themselves were not always happy about charging the workers, but they argued that in order for them to stay in, to stay in business and get those contracts from companies who weren't prepared to pay the recruitment costs, um, they were having to charge, um, charge workers. Others were, are, are just unscrupulous and, and don't really care. But I think that there are enough agencies probably around uh, if, there, um, if, we, if, if legislation was passed in the origin countries forbidding them to take money from workers, uh, that would go a long way, I think, to um, changing the culture of paying recruitment fees to these agencies. I mean, the, the, the strange thing is, that they expect to pay for these jobs. They're people who are desperate for these jobs and they, um, they're they used to um, uh, to paying for uh, the recruitment agencies. In fact, some of them will, will go to the agencies that charge the most because they think that that's going to give them a, a better guarantee of getting a job. And indeed, uh, there have been uh, examples where if a recruitment agent says, that they don't have to pay anything, they won't trust the agency. So there is a culture of paying and that that's a big issue that has to be changed and that's through, I think, not just education uh, and informing them about their rights and what they should and shouldn't do, but rather it would be easier to just pass legislation in the origin countries that forbids agencies to take money from workers. That's my view and I think that that would be much a much quicker and simpler um, process of changing that practice and culture. Thank you. Uh, are there any final thoughts on that question? Or can we move on to the next question? Well, thank you for your very thorough answers to all of our panelists.
So we have another question, and this one is for Hutan. Um, Hutan, can you elaborate, and if you can't, um, we certainly understand, but um, in the breakdown that you gave of the uh, billions of dollars, um, U.S. dollars, in terms of the industry um, size of this, this exploitation, do you have a percentage of how much the construction industry makes up those percentages, or is there not a breakdown available yet? Yeah, thanks for that question. Uh, we, we don't have a specific breakdown for the construction, nor for manufacturing and mining. Uh, the, the more you break down these numbers, the, the, the less reliable they become. Uh, so unfortunately, no, we haven't broken it down to that level. Thank you for that. Okay, we have another question, and this question is for Dr. Giordini. Can you talk about inspection challenges related to domestic work and whether inspectors can go into private homes to inspect? Also, when you're talking about agricultural work, can you go into a private farm? Um, I can say clearly that it's very, with regard to domestic work, it's very, very difficult. Private homes are sacred and you would need um, a judicial um, uh, uh, signing in order to for inspectors to actually go into a home. Uh, so this is a difficulty with migrant domestic workers. They're, they're um, not only kind of trapped in the same way, but they're, they're, they're not visible because they are living within the household. Um, it's very, very difficult. And um, the main uh, sources of information about the problems that they um, that they face, uh, which in many cases are pretty horrendous, um, is when they might escape or somehow get in touch with the embassy and get rescued. Um, so, so that's a, a, a different dimension altogether. Um, but you also have uh, a lot of women who are deployed uh, into what are called cleaning companies where they may uh, go into households uh, on an hourly basis. Um, and they are usually kind of manpower supply companies that might specialize in a particular area like security or, or doing domestic work and domestic cleaning. Um, but they don't live within the household. And they are more accessible, although there's very little uh, oversight and regulation of them. And I think that's another area that needs to be looked into more carefully. So with regard, I, I, I cannot tell you about agricultural workers. I have not looked into that, um, into that area. Um, but I imagine it's uh, also a similar um, set of circumstances. So how, private households are, um, are difficult. Uh, and very difficult to research, although I have done that in Lebanon and in Egypt, uh, but not, not here uh, as yet. Thank you, Dr. Giardini. So we have another question about the predicted impact of federal acquisition regulation ending trafficking in persons um, or contractors to the U.S. and foreign states. Does anyone have any thoughts on that um, or able to expand on that? Could you repeat the question, please, Kristen? Sure. There's a question about the predicted impact of federal acquisition regulation ending trafficking in persons and um, specifically contractors to the U.S. and foreign states. I think they're asking about um, U.S. contractors. Um, you know, in terms of, of right relation, regulation and, and the recruitment piece. Um, I don't, this must be a specific piece of um, yeah. regulation. I don't know if anyone is familiar with it. Declan, that might be a question for you. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with it. So it's it's the, sure. the executive order uh, against traffic, strengthening uh, protections against trafficking in, in, in federal contracts. Um, so the executive order came out in September 2012. And the final federal acquisition re uh, regulation, the FAR Council rule, came into effect on March 2nd. Um, and and it, as the name suggests, it strengthens existing anti-trafficking uh, regulations that are applicable to all federal contractors. But it imposes additional obligations on um, uh, contractors who um, provide services 
or goods on um, uh, contracts in excess of 500,000 uh, US dollars that are performed, performed abroad. Um, and it includes certain prohibitions like uh, no charging of recruitment fees. It requires contractors to submit uh, recruitment and housing plans. It uh, prohibits passport retention. Um, it's, it's arguably the most far-reaching um, uh, sort of either statute or legislative remedy that's on the books, certainly that we have seen, that we Verite have seen. It's, it's unclear as of yet how it will be enforced. Uh, the federal, federal, U.S. federal government is still um, kind of ruminating on, you know, how contractors will certify. There's a certification requirement at the start of the contract. Um, there's an obligation to recertify annually. Um, it has what are known as mandatory flow down provisions, which means if I'm a if I'm a contractor and I have multiple tiers of subcontractors or suppliers, I'm also certifying that that entire supply chain uh, is free of um, trafficking related activities, or if through conducting what's known as appropriate due diligence, um, any such activities are detected, that there's a reasonable plan. Um, to uh, to remediate, um, and there are pretty significant uh, financial penalties associated. Um, payment contract payments could be delayed. Um, the contract could be could be cancelled, um, and theoretically, um, contractors could be debarred from bidding on um, you know future U.S. Uh, U.S. contractors, it's undoubtedly of interest to the construction sector because a lot of construction companies are also uh, U.S. federal contractors. Um, so that's a kind of a, a quick, uh, sort of a quick, the, the, the rules are in place. Um, there is not an enforcement track record yet. Um, so it, it's, it's hard to predict um, it, its exact impact. I, I, I can tell you that there are other sectors, the electronics sector, for example, uh, the Electronics Industry Citizen Co Coalition, Citizenship Coalition, excuse me, the EICC, um, recently amended its industry code and announced this publicly that to prohibit the charging of recruitment fees to workers, in part with an eye to the, uh, the FAR rules and the executive order, because a lot of their members are also suppliers to the federal government. So. Um, Hopefully that's helpful. If I can just, uh, it's Hutan here, just add, uh, I mean, that's, that's perfect. Nothing more to add specifically on, uh, on the executive order. Uh, j just that this will be one of the uh, issues that will be discussed at a conference uh, in Washington, D.C. next week, as well as uh, at UCLA, California. On, the, on Wednesday and then Friday, uh, looking also at the California Transparency Act as well as uh, in Brazil the São Paulo Transparency Act, which are you know the models are fairly similar to see what are the lessons learned and what have been some of the challenges on the implementation side, uh, because that is really where the challenges uh, lie, as Declan has mentioned. Thank you. Thank you, Hutan. Can I just add one brief yeah, please. comment? Um, one of the challenges there also is that um, while there is a stipulation that workers should not pay recruitment fees, um, uh, some research that's been done by um, Sam McCann, a lawyer in Washington, shows that even on US bases in places like Afghanistan and Iraq where there are workers, they asked the workers in the beginning, uh, from the very beginning, that since they arrived, if they had paid fees. And the workers, if the workers say no, then it's acceptable and they, and they continue their work. But what's been discovered is that um, they may have, in fact, paid uh, recruitment fees, but they, they say that they haven't. Why? Because they know that if they said they have, then that they're going to be sent home. That the, um, in fact, what happens is that the, the victim ends up being um, victimized uh, again. In other words, that they'll lose their jobs. So the, the, the big challenge is that when they have paid recruitment fees, are they going to reveal that they have? Um, and this is the dilemma. Um, 
And this is where organizations like Verite are important because they can interview workers and, uh, and, and really try to get to the truth of the matter. And if the, if the workers are not going to be penalized for it, then they're more likely to be honest about what, um, whether they paid those fees or not. Um, and that's, that's a big, big challenge uh, across the board is, is the, um, uh, the verification of compliance uh, with these regulations. Yeah, this is Declan here. Ray's, Ray's, you know, spot on. Um, I think I mentioned this earlier in the presentation. Um, you know, a, a, a migrant worker's greatest fear, notwithstanding the conditions under which he or she is toiling, is that they will lose that job. Um, so ensuring confidentiality, ensuring non-retaliation, not singling out workers um, when investigating these matters is of, is of critical importance. Otherwise, well-intentioned compliance, supply chain, human resources staff can often um, uh, find it difficult to uncover the truth of what, of what has happened because workers are concerned that they will they will suffer the consequences. In many cases, they have indeed, uh, you know, been intimidated or, or, or threatened, um, and certainly coached. Um, you know, some of some of the stories that we uncover um, are, are just, to be honest, are just stranger than fiction. Um, we have a very um, deliberate and, and um, sort of careful methodology um, when, when we're interviewing migrant workers. Um, we don't use translators or interpreters. We insist on using native speaking, uh, ideally compatriots, but certainly native speaking uh, workers matched to the populations in the particular workplace or site. Um, the interviews have to be conducted privately. There can be no, um, you know, coaching. There can be no um, uh, even implicit uh, threats of denunciation or. Um, uh, or retaliation. It is a, frankly, it's a, it's a skill set uh, onto itself, um, and, and it's important that in many cases that individual workers are not identified, because others will not come forward if that is the, uh, if that is the case. Thank you, Jacqueline. Um, we have time for about for one more question before we're going to give concluding remarks and, and final announcements. Um, so the next question is about um, replicating in other sectors. So we talked about a number of practices and, and initiatives and interventions that are um, pertaining to the construction industry. Do you see how any of these could be replicated in Similar industries, I know we talked about the electronic sector, um, but do you see any of these carrying over into other sectors? And this is for any of our panelists. Sorry, can you repeat the question? Sure, this is about um, practices, promising practices within the construction industry. Uh, do you see any of these practices that could be replicated in some form in other sectors? Um, this is Declan here. I'll take a very brief stab at this question. Um, certainly from, from our perspective, we really don't see anything as of yet in the construction sector that could be applied elsewhere. I w we would be suggesting the construction sector look at others in order to bring in what they're doing. Um, there are, not necessarily at a sectoral level, but there are individual companies in, in electronics, in, in, in apparel, uh, in food and agriculture who have begun either independently or in kind of cl small clusters of leading companies to address, uh, to address these issues. Um, and, and they're beginning now to sort of um, uh, expand to the industry, to their industry sectors because they see what the, the leaders are doing. The, the one thing I would say is for the most part the, the solutions are relatively straightforward and at hand in terms of understanding what they are. Not suggesting that implementation is easy, um, but from each of the panelists uh, here in the past hour and a half to, to, to two hours, I think we've, we've talked about many of those. 
if I may, this is Hutan, just, just to add, it's exactly true. I mean, uh, for exa an example would be what one of our projects in Brazil is doing with uh, a number of uh, enterprises and companies in different sectors. Um, what we do, we've formed a partnership with them that once the labor, the mobile labor inspector units in Brazil find victims and rescue them, then we train them according to the skill sets that are needed within these companies that we made the partnership with, with a guaranteed job, a formal regular job, a decent job for these uh, rescued uh, slave laborers. And that's how in Brazil we're trying to break this vicious cycle uh, because if you just rescue uh, victims and you do nothing with them, uh, try to help them to integrate into the formal economy, then research has shown that they're very highly likely to go back into slave labor. So that's one thing that the construction sector, you know, together could do, could be part of the solution, in fact. Thank you. Dr. Giardini, do you want to add anything to that? Well, I, I just briefly don't think that there is any impediment to broadening this to other sectors. Um, I can tell you that there already have been cases here in Qatar where um, in the Qatar Foundation, for example, they did not renew a contract with a labor supplier here, a manpower supplier, um, and took over the direct employment of uh, over 200 workers from that organization, put them into decent accommodation, increased their salaries, and gave them a much better uh, set of conditions of, um, of life and work here. Um, but that, of course, means that it comes at a cost. Uh, the cost of doing that uh, can be quite high. In fact, uh, uh, the cost to the foundation was something like three times as much as what they were paying by using a, a labor supplier. Nonetheless, um, they considered it to be uh, appropriate to, to clean up the situation and to um, free up these workers. So th things are happening. It can be done. Uh, uh, and where there's the, a will to do it, and to do it properly, and the and the, the knowledge of how to do these things properly, um, with proper evaluations of what's occurring, um, and um, and doing something about it. In another case, uh, there was a company that um, decided to reimburse the workers for the money that they paid the recruitment agents, um, and then they charged the recruitment agents to recoup the money that they paid back to the workers. So it can be done. Um, um, and uh, I think there just needs to be greater momentum uh, in, in cleaning up these, these situations that lead to forced labor. Thank you so much, Dr. Giardini. So now we're officially out of time for questions, and we're going to go to concluding comments. For those of you who did send in a question, um, we will try and get back to you uh, with those answers. I apologize that we didn't get to everyone. So for all of the panelists, we'll, we'll go in order of presentation, starting with Declan. Um, if you could give your final comments and thoughts to, to leave the audience with on this topic. And, and so Declan, we'll start with you. Uh, okay, uh, Christina, uh, thank you. I, I suppose all I want to do is, is, is um, thank everybody for, for, for attending and their attention. I think um, you've, you've, you know, re received a, um, uh, you know, a lot of information. It's a lot certainly to absorb um, uh, in, in a short period here. Uh, you know, the one thing that I would say is, well, this issue can appear daunting at times, and, and very often we find that companies kind of, um, you know, recoil a little at the thought of forced labor and human trafficking, um, you know, in their supply chains. It, it does occur. It occurs across a myriad of sectors and, and you know, and regions. Um, but, you know, by shining a bright light uh, on the labor supply chain to raise point, you know, just, just earlier there, these issues can be addressed. And there are companies out there, and while they don't necessarily all publicize their efforts, there are companies out there who are making uh, strides that are, um, uh, you know, affecting you know, measurable change, um, you know, that ultimately positively impact 
the lives of um, of this vulnerable vulnerable group of uh, of migrant workers. So certainly, I would I would just encourage companies to you know to engage um, to the extent that they can within their supply chains and, and help you know solve this uh, solvable problem. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. Yes. Thank you. Uh, just very quickly, I want to emphasize again that this is a global problem. It exists in every single country in the world and in every sector. Uh, and I am fully 100% convinced that if we were going to improve the situation and eliminate the problem, employers have a fundamental role in the solution to the problem. Uh, you know, the governments can't do it alone, the employers can't do it alone, the workers can't do it alone either. either. So it, it is really, uh, you know, the NGOs can't do it alone either. So there is a role to play for everyone, including the consumers, uh, and, you know, that's where we need to really try to focus and better coordinate our actions. If not, uh, you know, uh, very often uh, we, go in, we may go in different directions and see that we waste a lot of time, effort, and money, and more people are, uh, are fall into the traps and they continue to be vulnerable. And thank you, everyone, for their attention. Thank you, Hutan. Dr. Giardini? Yes, I, I would like to support everything that uh, Declan and Hutan have just said, in, indeed. Um, and, and, you know, while many companies, and I think that the, the companies themselves have to come to the realization, often they don't realize the, the import of what is actually occurring in their companies. Uh, and those, um, quite often when I've spoken to company management uh, and pointed out that they, you know, the situation of their employees means that they are Im they are implicated in human trafficking. Uh, their jaws just drop. I mean, they don't think about it. And they haven't thought about it in those terms. So there's a lot of um, awareness raising that needs to be um, developed uh, in the employing companies themselves and to show them that their supply chain, um, that they are responsible for what happens in the other companies and they can't, they can no longer put their heads in the sand and, and, um, and not look down the supply chain to make sure that um, everything uh, is complying with international law and indeed local law. Um, and, and uh, quite often, I think it just needs to be pointed out to them in clear terms that there are, they have a moral obligation not to be a part of these kinds of practices um, and that they should look ahead and, and take proactive um, policies that um, themselves need to, to eke out those um, violations in their own companies and along the supply chain, as, as Declan has pointed out. Um, and it can be done. Uh, and uh, Hutan's point about everybody playing their part, I think, is absolutely correct. Uh, and that is occurring. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Giardini. Thank you to all our pa panelists for the extraordinary work and expertise and time that you've put into this global webinar today. I think that this is such an important topic, and I think we've really tried to create a safe space so that we can have a dialogue about what corporations can do and what companies can do to address this issue. And I think we have a lot to look forward to in the anti-trafficking community in terms of change um, and positive impacts that can be made. So thank you to you all for your work on this. Um, you're an inspiration to all of us. And now I want to make one announcement before everyone leaves. Uh, this webinar was our fifth webinar in our series, and we're going to be coming upon our final webinar um, in our emerging, emerging Issues Surrounding Human Trafficking in the Private Sector series. And we hope you'll join us for our next global webinar, The Price of Life, Responding to the Global Black Market in Illicit Organs. This is, a, this is a topic that's very near and dear to me. I've been trying to do um, a, a webinar on this for about six years, and I'm thrilled that the Global Initiative and TRAC and, and McKenna Long and Aldrich have partnered to, to do this webinar. Um, and it'll be on Wednesday, June 17th from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Eastern Daylight Savings Time and from 4 to 6 p.m. Central European Time. And more information will be posted on the Global Initiative website, www.globalinitiative.net. Thank you to all of you for sticking with us for the two-hour conversation. Uh, I want to hear your questions or feedback. Uh, please email me at Christina Bain, 
um, via cbain at babson.edu. And thank you so much again for joining us, and I wish you all a great day and a great evening. Bye-bye.